as we speak, the question of uh, halachic uh, status, the rabbinic opinion on whether uh, marijuana is kosher or not kosher, is very high on the agenda. It's a hot topic, and it's debated intensely with opinions ranging from one extreme to the other. So obviously, there's no clarity. Let's take a look at a few technicalities before we get to the main, to the main theme. First, there are people who ask, why is this any different than alcohol? No rabbis ever said you're not allowed to drink alcohol. Alcohol is addictive. And if the problem is the fear of addiction, then why is wine OK and not marijuana? In fact, we know that wine is addictive. We've had alcoholics forever. We're not sure that cannabis is addictive. It can become addictive. You'll add all sorts of ingredients to make it addictive. Yeah, well, that's what they did with cigarettes. So what is the difference between alcohol and drugs? From what I can tell, the real difference is the effect that it has. And you can tell me if, if, uh, if you agree with this or not. Alcohol relaxes your inhibitions. It affects your emotions. When you get drunk, or at least a little high on alcohol, you just don't care anymore. You don't see the world differently. You don't have a new perspective. Your mind is not working, certainly not any better. It doesn't really affect your mind directly. It affects your emotions. Drugs, on the other hand, their entire purpose is to affect your brain. So that you see things, you, you perceive differently, your, your reality is altered. With alcohol, your reality is not altered. You just don't care. So does that make a difference? Well, let's consider this. Um, in the Torah, it says that the Kohen, when he comes to serve in the temple, is not allowed to have had any wine or, or alcohol. And if he comes into the, into the temple a little, uh, a little boozed up, it's a severe punishment for it. But if a guy was putting on tefillin and he was drunk, not, not fall down drunk, but did he not fulfill the mitzvah? He fulfilled the mitzvah. But if his mind was altered and he puts on tefillin, has he fulfilled the mitzvah? That's a, that's a huge question. Now, we know that when you perform a circumcision on an infant, unless there are circumstances that make it absolutely necessary, we do not give the child anesthetic. Why not? Well, first of all, the anesthetic may hurt more than the circumcision. But also because the whole point of the mitzvah is that the body should experience it. If you numb the body, you've, you've destroyed the mitzvah. In other words, if you alter the natural condition, then the mitzvah is not performed in reality. So it's not a mitzvah. So is there a difference between a person who's a little drunk and puts on tefillin? or a person who's a little high and puts on tefillin. It may very well be. Being drunk does not alter your reality. In fact, you may even be more relaxed and appreciate the mitzvah 
Whereas with the drugs, it's not you putting on the tefillin. This is not the real you. This is the altered you. So who's performing the mitzvah? Who gets credit for it? You or the drugs? So we're going to have marijuana doing a lot of mitzvahs. So that's one consideration. There's another consideration. Is it dangerous? Rabbi Feinstein, many, many years ago, ruled that you're not allowed to use uh, marijuana because it wrecks the body. Now, you can argue that that was many years ago. Back then, the medical world believed that it is physically dangerous and, and destructive. And so Rabbi Feinstein, following the medical opinion, ruled that you're not allowed, because you're not allowed to harm your body. But now that the medical world has changed its opinion, and now claims that there is no harm, and it is not dangerous, and it doesn't destroy your body, does that ruling still hold? So here we come to a really important, fascinating definition of what Jewish law is all about. If the medical world says that this is dangerous, then of course the halacha, the rabbis, the Torah is going to rule against it. In other words, the physical reality determines the halacha. Or is it the opposite? God determines reality. If the halacha says, whether it's Rabbi Akiva from the Gemara or Rabbi Feinstein from, uh, where was it? Far Rockaway? Where did he go? Lower East Side. Either way, if the halacha says this is forbidden, that's the reality. This is God's opinion of marijuana. And therefore, it shouldn't be surprising that it will cause some physical harm. In other words, the halacha determines reality, not the other way around. So it's not that every time doctors change their mind, the halacha has to change its mind. Because the halacha is not dependent. It considers medical science and so on. But it is not dependent on it. The science does not cause halacha. In many cases, we found where when halacha disagreed with medicine, in the long run, the halacha turned out to be correct. Rabbi Feinstein, by the way, an amazing, amazing man, was a truly godly inspired individual. Um, we had an interesting story. This couple came to Minnesota back in the 70s. And uh, they told me this amazing, amazing story. She was a convert. And they got married. And then they realized that he is a Kohen, so he's not allowed to be married to a convert. And they were horrified because they were so happily married. They went to Rabbi Feinstein. Now, what do you expect a rabbi to say? What could he possibly say? If you ask the average, the average yeshiva boy, they would say, well, what will he say? He'll question whether the Kohen is really a Kohen. And if he can cancel that, then they can stay married. Listen to what Rabbi Feinstein did. He said to this woman, why did you convert? She said, because I wasn't Jewish. He said, how do you know? She said, what do you mean? My family was not Jewish. He says, prove it. Have you ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> anyway, she went and did research for a long, long time. And I don't remember all the details. She ended up in Utah at their, at their uh, 
the library there where they have a record of every birth that ever had. She traced her mother's family back to President Adams. And she was poring over the books there in the library. And the librarian came over after weeks of her hanging around there. He said, what are you doing? What are you, what are you so intense about? And she told him the family name, the mother's family name. She said, I'm doing research on this name. And he says, yeah, that's an interesting name. You'd never think they're Jewish. She says, what? He says, oh, yeah. Take a look at the, fo the folder, the file, on the first lady. I think it's the second Adams. There's practically nothing there. She has a biblical name and, and no information because she was Jewish. Anyway, she didn't need to convert. Turns out that she was Jewish all along and they're happily married. Only, only a divinely inspired individual could come up with that. So what motivated him? Not the facts on the ground, the way it's perceived in heaven. That's called a real halachic authority. Halachic authority means someone in tune with what God thinks. So if Rabbi Feinstein says, this is forbidden, because it's unhealthy. Well, if it wasn't unhealthy till then, It'll now become unhealthy because that's what the Torah says. So that's just a thought on how halacha works. Let's talk about the marijuana itself. There really is not anywhere, which is also interesting. There is so much written about wine and alcohol, when you're allowed, how much you're allowed, how bad it is, how ugly it is to get drunk, how forbidden it is to do the... Not, nothing, not a single mention of a, of a drug or hallucinogenic anywhere. And they were so popular. Yeah, it was never kosher. That's the whole point, that the Torah doesn't deal with it because it's just completely out of the question. Now. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody quotes the Rebbe from back in the 60s that uh, somebody asked the Rebbe about marijuana, and the Rebbe's answer is, I can't believe you're asking. It's like... What's, what, what's the question? So why? Why is it so beyond the pale? Also depends who was asking, right? <laughs> I can't believe you're asking. Uh, here's, here's the thing. There may have been times, there may have been conditions, there may have been societies where marijuana would have been okay, maybe even beneficial. If it helps you relax, it puts you in a good mood, it could work. Today, under present circumstances, with society the way it is, it's bound to be a disaster. Not that an individual can't benefit, but as a group, it would be the end of our civilization. The underlying problem, the underlying disease of our time is narcissism. We have grown so attached to ourselves, already addicted to ourselves, that many experts say that you know, addictive personalities should not, should not start up with the... Today, who is not an addictive personality? 
Who is not addicted today to themselves? Narcissism is an addiction. And the addiction is to, to your own impulses, to your own pleasures, to your own importance. When the Alter Rebbe wrote the Tanya, it was predicted that this will be the cure for the diseases before the coming of Mashiach. Uh, Tanya is not a cure for pneumonia. <laughs> it may take your mind off it, but it does not cure pneumonia, right? So for which disease is Tanya the cure? And we don't mean just Tanya, we mean Hasidic philosophy. What is the disease before Mashiach? It's not pneumonia. It's not tuberculosis. It's not even cancer. The disease prior to Mashiach is narcissism. We are so addicted to ourselves that we're killing ourselves. Uh, most people would say narcissism means um, uh, selfish. No. A selfish person does what is best for himself. A narcissist does not. The narcissist will kill himself over nothing, simply because he can't not follow his impulses which is where it comes from. Narciss, Narciss, what was his name? Huh? Narciss. That guy, he looked in the water and he saw his reflection for the first time and he fell in love with himself. And he couldn't tear himself away. So he stared at himself until he starved to death. That's not selfish. A selfish guy gets up and has something to eat. This is something different. This is definitely an addiction. Addiction means an impulse to do something even if it's killing you. Now, to come to a generation of narcissists and say, why don't you have some marijuana? This is deadly combination. The, the exact worst thing you can give a narcissist. You don't want to make people comfortable in their narcissism. At least create a little discomfort. So what does Hasidus say? This, this is revolutionary and probably the future of, of psychology. The healthy individual, what's a healthy individual? Who's healthy? <laughs> Don't give me name and address. What, what, what constitutes a healthy person? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And that's part of the danger in the medical world today. They're treating patients and, and they don't have a definition for healthy. We know more or less what's unhealthy, but that's not enough. Because if you're a doctor, you want to bring the person back to health, and you don't have a definition for that. So how do you know if you're doing it? Like this guy who said, a guy comes to the doctor, he's got fever, he's got aches and pains, and he's got a rash. The doctor treats him, and there's no aches, and no pains, no fever, and no rash. Well, either this guy has been cured, or he died. Because it, it's the same result. So when the doctor takes away, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when the doctor takes away those symptoms, has he made him healthier, or has he moved him closer to death? Now his body can't even produce a fever. <coughs> so, 
If we don't have a definition for health, how are we supposed to get there? Psychologically, I remember a time when the, defin the working definition for a healthy individual was a person who can solve his problems. Remember that? Back in the 60s, I think. If you're not capable of solving your problems, then you are an invalid, and the government may, take, may step in and take over your life. Put you in an institution, whatever they want to do, because you're, you're not functional. Of course, they gave that up pretty quickly, <laughs> because the doctors couldn't solve their problems, so that couldn't possibly be a good definition. And of course, we're not. We're not problem solvers. We live with our problems. We don't solve them. So what then is a healthy human being? So more, more recently, the definition, more or less, is that if you have frustrated needs, if you have repressed emotions, that's going to stifle your whole system, block up your whole you know, whatever, and, and you're not going to function properly. If you dig deep, uncover those needs and bring them to light, that's half the cure. Then if you can actually satisfy those needs, then you'll be perfect. It's not working so good. Because every time you satisfy a need, you discover another one. And the work goes on. Hasidus says something revolutionary. Two hundred years ago. If you dig into the essence of a human being, if you go beyond b below the surface, you're not going to find repressed needs. That's just part of the surface. That's still just the functional or dysfunctional level of the human being. If you get past that layer and reach the person, you will discover that the essence of a human being has no needs. You don't need anything. All of our needs are either imposed or imagined. Torah says, Merubim tzarche amcha, we read it on Yom Kippur, Merubim tzarche amcha vedaitom ktsara. We pray to God to help us because we have two problems. We have many needs and insufficient knowledge. Hasidus says, that's one problem. We have many needs because we have insufficient knowledge. If we understood ourselves better, we wouldn't have all those needs. So in very practical terms, what is the definition of a human being? This, this is beautiful and profound at the same time. Hasidah says, in this world, there is the mineral world, the, anim, the vegetable world, the animal world, and the human. What is a mineral? A mineral is a statement. Poetically, every mineral makes a statement, speaks. The stone speaks. It says, I am. That's it. That's what a mineral is. God created something that just is. It says, hi. That's all. It doesn't have any color. It doesn't have growth. It doesn't have movement. It doesn't have breath of life because it's just a statement. Like, God said, let there be, so there be. And that's all there be. 
I am because I am, and that's all what I am. That's a mineral. God also had some pleasure in creating the world. That pleasure shows up in the world of vegetation. Why do vegetables grow and blossom and have a good smell and bright colors? Why do they make you feel good when you're in, out in nature? It's because vegetable means an existence. God said, let there be. But this existence enjoys existing. It reflects God's pleasure in creating it. So the mineral only reflects the word. God said, be, it is. The vegetable reflects a little bit of God's pleasure. And pleasure expresses itself in color, growth, flowering. So poetically, what is a vegetable? A song. The, the mineral speaks, the vegetable sings. That's what it is. What is an animal? An animal is another creation. God said, let there be, let the earth give forth living creatures, the water, whatever. But this creature not only gets pleasure from life, from, from existence, but actually fights for its existence. It clings to its existence. And therefore, it expresses not only the pleasure of life, but the gratitude for life. And that's why the Medrash says that every animal sings praise and thanks God for its existence. So the mineral speaks, the vegetable sings, the animal praises, thanks God. Now, what's a human being? <laughs> like, what's left? The human being is quantitatively different, completely of a different, of a different nature. And that is, the human being, this is the definition, not, not, not the purpose or the philosophy, just the definition. What makes a human being human rather than animal, rather than angel? The human being, by definition, is not content being human. The vegetable likes being a vegetable. The mineral is content being a mineral. And the animal, if you just leave him alone, he's perfectly happy. Not a human being. The human being is, by his very essence, never content being human. Why? Because being human is what he was given. What has he accomplished? So if a human being feels, I am a successful human being, he's miserable. Because the human being needs to be something more than he is created to be. So again, here's the definition. A human being is never content being human. So the question is, what's your alternative? Don't want to be human? What do you want to be? Often, for lack of any better idea, the human being decides to be an animal. I mean, you look at ancient history. Human beings wanted to be like eagles. They wanted to be like snakes. They wanted to be like dragons. They want they wanted the, the, the qualities of animals, even competing with animals. That showed the human instinct of not being content to be human, but not seeing any other alternative. They figured, if I can't be human, then let me be animal. You read about this guy in India or in China, I don't know where he is. He's been sitting in a, under a bush for th six years, 
hasn't moved, hasn't eaten, hasn't had a drink, and he's perfectly healthy? You read about this? He's a celebrity. <laughs> I think what he has managed to do is to become a vegetable. He literally grows like a vegetable. A little rain, a little sunshine, he's fine. Connected to the earth. Is that possible? Whatever. <laughs> so a human being can become a vegetable if he really tries hard. He can become an animal rather easily. What the Torah says is, you're not content being human because you're supposed to be godly, a partner with God in creation. So when a human being is unhappy or not content, this is not a sign of illness. This is a sign of his humanity. A content human being is either a vegetable or an animal. The human being is never content being human. So when a person comes and says, what's the purpose of life? Say, oh my, are you depressed? No. I'm thinking. Yeah, well, that's dangerous. <laughs> what is the purpose of life? Animals don't ask that. Vegetables don't ask that. Why can't you settle down and just be? Whatever you are, just be it. No, because then you're not a human being. So if a kid gets into a bad mood and you ask him to clean up his room or put away a toy and he says, I didn't ask to be born. Prozac? Hmm? Therapy for the rest of his life? Sounds depressed. Actually, it's just proving the point. If you really understand a human being, we don't ask to be born. Why? Because we don't need to be. There's absolutely no need for me to be born. My need. If I were never created, I would never complain. So it's not like I was sitting somewhere saying, why don't you create me already? No. In fact, when I was told I was going to be created, I, I kind of pleaded not to. I don't need this. So when a child says, I didn't ask to be born, that's true. You objected a long time ago, before you were even conceived, you already objected. Some kids are so stubborn, they never get over it. I said no. <laughs> Imagine God comes to the soul and says, I need you to go down into this world. And the soul says, no, no, I don't want to go. But he goes anyway, right? And now he's resentful. He says, I said no. I know you didn't really ask me, but I said no. And you created me anyway, now I'm angry. They're born angry, resentful. So when a child says, I didn't ask to be born, you shouldn't panic. You should simply say, neither did I. Nobody asks to be born. There, there are some new age philosophies that say, you, you ask to be born, you pick your parents, you pick your circumstances. Uh, no. If we got to pick, we <laughs> things would be very different. But we don't ask because we don't need. Now you wake up, you're born, you didn't ask, and now you have to eat. You have to eat. You'll even wake your mother up in the middle of the night and demand food. And you don't care that she hasn't slept. Because you have to eat. Now, technically, if I don't need to be born, why would I need to eat? If I didn't ask to be born, 
Why do I need to drink? The answer is, I don't. I don't. And that's why often the, the need to eat that I have, I resent. I don't want this. I want a diet, and I can't. Who did this to me? So, if we're, if we're precise with our words, a human being needs to eat. Not true. Human beings need to stop eating. But we don't have that option. We didn't ask to be born, and we were born anyway. We didn't ask to eat, and we have to eat anyway. So two things. First of all, it's not my need. I need this like a hole in the head. <coughs> Secondly, it's not a need, it's a handicap. There's an important distinction here. A guy breaks his leg and he's walking on a, on a cane, on a, on a crutch. So he, well, he needs a crutch. He doesn't need a crutch. Nobody needs a crutch. He needs his leg to heal. Until then, he has to use a crutch. But he doesn't need a crutch. It's a handicap. Nobody needs a handicap. So when we think about ourselves from a healthy perspective, we realize none of the needs that I have are mine. Because I didn't ask for this. So I need to eat? Not really. God needs me to eat. Why? I don't know. But I can't claim it as mine. This gives us an, a fascinating insight into what it means to do everything for the sake of heaven. L'shem shamayim. How do you eat l'shem shamayim? Well, if you're eating with the intention of using the strength and the energy you get from the food in order to do a mitzvah after you finish eating, uh, yeah. Good luck. Uh, according to what we're saying now, the only way to eat is l'shem shamayim. Because every time you sit down to eat, ask yourself, you need this? No. So why do you have to eat? Because he wants. Right? I was talking to a woman who, who had been severely anorexic. She had gotten a lot better, but she, you know, food was still a problem for her. So we sit down, and she says, I, I, I find eating distasteful. I said, yeah. Gemara, the Mishnah says, the more you eat, the more the worms are going to have what to eat in, in the grave, and that eating is an animalistic behavior. And I just went on and on and on about how disgusting it is to eat. <laughs> she was a little shocked. She said, you're worse than me. <laughs> so I don't know why God did this to us. It's so humiliating that I have to do what animals do. It's such a handicap. It's so embarrassing. It's so degrading. But what can you do? God created you this way. So swallow your pride and eat something. Her problem went away. Partly because I didn't disagree with her. But that's, that's the truth. The truth is, you eat because God created you with that need. Not, not you, you didn't ask for this. So if you're eating, you're eating because God wants it. Just be conscious of that, and you're eating. L'shem shamayim. The future of human health is the discovery of that part within us that has no needs. Now, in a secular world where there's no belief in God and purpose and soul and whatever, that's a scary thought. 
I have no need, then what am I doing here? Then I'm, then I'm suicidal, then I'm, then I'm nihilistic, fatalistic, I, it's all over. But if you do believe in God, it's perfect. When you reach that part in yourself where you realize, I have no needs, what is your immediate reaction and response to that? I don't need to be here. So who needs me? Answer is, my creator. So when God comes to Avraham and says, uh, I got a mission for you, Avraham says, Hineni. You know what Hineni means? Unemployed. <laughs> Hineni, I'm available. Why am I available? Because I don't need anything. So I'm really glad to hear that you need something from me because that explains why I'm here. So it all comes together in a beautiful harmony. I'm, I'm not competing with God. Like, I have my needs, he has his needs. Why does he mix into my business? <laughs> if he has needs, let him take care of it. Leave me alone. I got my own problems. This is not the picture at all. Even children today are sensing, what do you want from me? I didn't ask for this. That is good. We're getting somewhere. It's not a depressing thought. It's a wisdom that has taken 5,770 years to realize. We don't have needs. Relax. So now we'll understand. The Gemara makes this statement that really sounds morbid. The Gemara says, you are conceived against your will. Good news? You are born against your will. You live against your will, and you die against your will. In other words, you're screwed. <laughs> Nothing is going to go your way. What a, depre <laughs> what a depressing description of life misunderstood it. It is so liberating. You don't need to be conceived. You don't need to be born. You don't need to live. You don't need to die. So you have no needs. Then what are you here for? To be something more than you were created. That's a human being. So the human being who doesn't ask, why am I here, is a happy animal, a content animal, a naked ape. A human being has only one request. Tell me what I'm here for. That's human. And when we can't find an answer to that, we get severely upset. This is not an academic question. It's not an idle question. What am I here for? Oh, nothing. Just enjoy. Mm -mm. So I had this experience when I first went out to Minnesota. You know, we don't get any training. You go out there and, you know, teach and, and, and help people, and what do we know? So I come out there, and this woman says to me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to a bridge, I'm jumping off, I'm going to kill myself. Why? It's all meaningless. Nothing means anything. It's all meaningless. I said, really? All meaningless? Nothing means anything? She says, no. I said, well, in that case, why do you need to kill yourself? It's all meaningless. Sit, get old, you'll die soon. Why do you have to kill yourself? What's the urgency? It's a good thing I didn't have a license, because <laughs> I would have lost it right there. But if you think about it, what makes people suicidal?
not pain. People who commit suicide out of pain is reasonable. What makes people suicidal is the thought that it's meaningless. But if it's meaningless, then what do you care? You're just here to be here. Doesn't mean anything. Enjoy. A human being can't do that. That's human. If I can't find a purpose, a meaning, a sense to my presence, then I, then I can't keep my presence. Because I can't be an animal, I can't be a vegetable, and I can't be a mineral. So what does it have to do with marijuana? The need to relax, the need to get out of my own head, the need to escape from reality, the need to enhance reality. Where is all this coming from? Even if it wasn't desperate, where is it coming from? Why do we need this? Because we haven't found a purpose. And without purpose, our existence is uncomfortable. So we try to ease that discomfort. The problem is, you ease it, you make it worse. Because you're basically telling yourself, there's no purpose. Relax. It goes against the grain. Maybe this, again, is the difference between alcohol and drugs. Alcohol means, I'm taking myself too seriously. i got to relax. So you drink, and you lose your inhibition, meaning you stop being so self-conscious, which could be good, because self-conscious is a trap. If you can get rid of your self-conscious, you're better. The drugs don't do that. The drugs give you an escape And that doesn't help at all. So what is the drug that we need today to cure the disease of today? The disease is me. The cure is serve God. Hineni. Even, even pneumonia, people would reco re recover from pneumonia if it weren't for the me. Like animals get sick and they, and they heal because they're not worried about me. They don't go fetching to their family. Oh, I feel lousy. There's no, there's no personal, without that personal angst, we would heal much better. We wouldn't get sick in the first place. So a person who's suffering from pneumonia is also suffering from, why me? I don't want this. Look what it's doing to me. That me element is our weakest point. We could handle all sorts of stuff. I mean, our parents went through World War II. How did they survive? You know, we always talk about how, how, how much they suffered. And of course they did. But we forget to think about how miraculous and how awesome that they survived. How did they survive? Years in a concentration camp. How do you survive? So let me tell you this incredible story. Uh, I come to Minnesota in 1969, 1970. And uh, there's a shul there, an old shul with a dozen members still living, all of them over 70. 
and uh, we have the minhag, a very good minhag, of saying the entire Tehillim on the Shabbos before the new month. Like this coming Shabbos. And it's nice to have a minion. So we're looking around. There were only three shluchim. And we're looking around. Who could we ask to join us to make a minion? And there were these two brothers from Poland who were the, the liveliest of the group. So I went over to one of the brothers, uh, Yidl, Yehuda, and I said to him, would you agree to come once a month, uh, every fourth Shabbos, come a little earlier to shul, and we'll say the whole Tehillim together. He says, only once a month? I said, yeah. He says, why? Why not every week? I said, look, don't, don't stop. I'm not looking for new customs. Our custom is to do it once a month. Would you come? He says, no, you don't understand. My brother and I say the entire Tehillim every Shabbos morning. I was a little surprised. So he tells me the story. They were in a concentration camp together. The Russians came in and liberated the camp. And with great fanfare, they told them, you are free to go home. They're standing at the gates of the camp, and they're completely lost. Go home? There's no home. There's no place to go. And leaving the camp was more frightening, was scarier than staying. So they were completely lost. As they're standing there, a Polish woman comes walking towards them with a huge basket and hands them a loaf of fresh, warm bread. Now, you explain this in, in whatever way you can. They promised each other that for this kindness that God has shown them, they will say the entire Tehillim every Shabbos morning. Is that superhuman? Three years in the concentration camp, and they can't get over God's kindness over the loaf of bread. Now, I would understand if they couldn't get over the kindness of this Polish woman, because the Poles were not known to be kind. <laughs> but to think, no, God just gave us this bread. And we have to thank him for it. Where, do, where does this happen in the human system? That's why they survived. They saw, they saw a purpose, they saw a plan, they saw a meaning, they didn't understand it. But they knew God was running the show, something was happening, and they're part of it, and they were not going to jump off a bridge and kill themselves. That's a healthy human being. The healthy human being is a person who can stop saying, why me? But I can't take this, but I'm in pain, but look at me, look. The person who is shocked by by the personal suffering. Why me? Look what's happening to me. I've lost all this weight. Everything hurts. It's... If you're not focused on the me, and you let yourself focus on who needs you, and why are you here, and who brought you here, and who's running the show, you can survive even three years in a concentration camp and come out not just barely alive, grateful. Hasidus teaches us this. Hasidus teaches us how to peel ourselves away from ourselves. How to raise children without that 
addiction to self, because every child is born with it. You raise your children to move them above, out of that addiction to self into the human condition, which is, I don't need to be here, so who needs me? That's life, that's healthy, that's the cure to narcissism, that's Torah, that's Judaism. It's all one package. And so the future of the world is a Jewish future. Like somebody said, uh, the future is not what it used to be. Good, no? I remember what the future was. My grandfather came from Poland. He was very orthodox, he was Hasidic, and he was absolutely convinced that he was the last of the Mohicans. His generation was gonna die out and Judaism was over. He was convinced. And it wasn't hard to be convinced because if you looked at the facts, the future in America was secular. Even today, ask people. You know, there are a lot of Bali Chuva, people are going to yeshiva, and they say, yeah, it's nice, but you know, 50 years from now, there's gonna be no yeshivas. They're starting to change their mind. Now people are starting to say, you know, 50 years from now, the only thing left, the only people left will be Muslims, and Satmars, because, <laughs> you know, they're having a lot of kids. So the future, all of a sudden, is a different future. Nobody can honestly or convincingly argue that the future is secular. No, it's not. There's hardly a family left that doesn't have a Balchuva. <laughs> <coughs> You know, there's a joke about a guy come to his reform rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, I don't, I don't know what's going on. My son went off to Israel. Somebody at the Kotel in, invited him to a yeshiva. He's in yeshiva. He's keeping kosher. He's, 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 he's praying in Hebrew. My daughter comes home and says that she's going to cover her hair and get married and have a dozen children. What did I do wrong? <laughs> the rabbi said, check your mezuzahs. <laughs> One of them might be kosher. <laughs> so this is the new future. The new future is, don't be shocked if the next door neighbor turns religious on you, or your own family. I think already the, ne the, the next generation is more observant than the parents. How that can be, I don't know. It's miraculous. Tradition doesn't go from the young to the old, but that's what's happening. So it's not a tradition, it's truth. Truth springs from the ground if it has to. So do we want marijuana? It, it is exactly the wrong direction. You want to wallow in narcissism? You want to feed people what will allow them to wallow in their narcissism? It's going to be a disaster. A generation without direction, without a philosophy, without a commitment, you're going to give them marijuana? That's cruel. So will it help some individuals who do have a purpose and who do have a... Maybe. But you can't think of individuals you got to think of the klal. And for the people, for, this, for the generation, for the... And I, I think that's what the Rebbe meant by, I can't believe you're asking this. It's like saying, I don't have any purpose. I don't see any purpose in, in, in getting up in the morning. So, so, so should I get drunk? Like, what? What? <laughs> What are you asking? 
There's a whole generation of people who are completely lost and don't understand why they exist. They have money, they have a house, they, have, they just don't know why they exist. Should they take drugs? So, are you kidding? What are you thinking? So whether it's permissible according to halacha, whether it is physically healthy or unhealthy, it is a bad idea and should not even be entertained. It simply shows how desperately we need to find our direction, how desperately we need to know our purpose. Because we're so desperate, we're even going to take marijuana. Can't let that happen. So the solution is we have to learn a little more Tanya, have to read the Rebbe Sicha to find out how we bring Mashiach, because we do have a task, we are needed, we are God's partners in creation, and we got to get busy. Enough is enough. It's time for the world to get fixed. And if we're busy fixing the world, you don't want marijuana. You don't even need to say l'chaim anymore. You just need to be l'chaim. That's healthy. What do you think? There are, there are two kinds of, based on what I heard, there are two kinds of purposes that you were telling the individual to be a part of. His own individual purpose and the purpose of Judaism, right? Which is, which is to serve as Hashem as, as, also, as an individual aspect and as an aspect. It's like lighting up their, their own purpose of life. So those people who can't really find it, they, those are the people who turn to marijuana. Well, for a long time, philosophically, people believe that you can find your purpose or actually create your own purpose. It, it, was, it was put in different words and different... Uh, everybody has their own truth. What's true for you is true for you. What's true for me? That bubba doesn't work. You can't come along at the age of 25 and say, I think I found a purpose. Either there is a purpose or there's none. You can't make one up. Purpose, when you say what is the purpose, you mean what purpose were we created for? You can't make one up. If you were not created for a purpose, then there's no purpose. So imagine a person says, my purpose in life is to become a doctor. That's not your purpose, that's just your intention. It may be a noble cause, but don't call it your purpose unless you were created to be a doctor. And maybe you were, but how do you know that? Who are you going to ask? <laughs> Who are you going to call? So purpose means I came into the world for a purpose, I just need to find out what it is. But if you didn't come in with a purpose, then there is no purpose. And then we're all depressed. So yes, there is an individual purpose. But in, in the larger picture, we're all here to serve God. Do we all serve God the same way? Obviously not. Men put on tefillin. Women don't. Jews keep Shabbos. Non-Jews don't. We're all serving God. But, you know, to start making up your own mitzvahs isn't serving anybody. So how do you know which mitzvahs you're supposed to excel at? Take a look at where life brings you, where, where God is leading you. You see success in a certain area? Follow that. God is showing you something. So take a hint. But it's all serving God by doing mitzvahs. How you do the mitzvah and the fact that you do it rather than your grandfather, that's significant. Because when you do the same mitzvah, it's a different mitzvah because you're a different person. 
I mean, it's so precise that if you put on tefillin today and then put on tefillin tomorrow, they're two completely different mitzvahs because in between today and tomorrow, you changed. You're a different you tomorrow than you are today. So when you put on tefillin tomorrow, that was never done before. Well, they're both escaping. One is escaping emotional issues. One is escaping a mental state. Alcohol takes you away from your emotional um, heaviness, and uh, drugs alters your perception. No. No. When a person is drunk, he knows he's a loser. He just doesn't care. I'm a loser. <laughs> but when you take drugs, you don't think you're a loser. But you are. <laughs> so with alcohol, you lose your inhibitions. With drugs, you lose your brains. You lose your mind. And is that just semantics? No. The, the real danger is, like with alcohol, once you lose your inhibitions, you want to do it again. In fact, you want to do it more. Same thing with drugs. Once you can alter your, your perception, you want to alter it more. That's really going in a bad... Yeah. No, no. Medicinal uses are absolutely divine blessing. Anything that can help a child who's autistic or take away some of the pain of people in chronic, oh, that, that is a blessing from heaven. No question, no doubt, not even a hesitation. I'll tell you an interesting story. There was a rabbi in a community in, in Europe he was, he was sitting, giving a class. Some guy comes running in. It was Shabbos afternoon. He comes running into the rabbi. And he says, Rabbi, my wife is seriously ill. Am I allowed to warm up water for her? The rabbi said, yes, yes, go. When the community heard about it, they fired the rabbi. Why? He had been the rabbi of that community for eight years. And they argued, in eight years, you are responsible for this community, and there is still someone in the community who doesn't warm up the water for his wife and comes to ask whether he's allowed to? You're dangerous. They fired him. You hear what I'm saying? He had not educated his community First, you heat up the water. Then you ask the rabbi. <laughs> but my wife is in danger. Should I help her? Who educated you? See how... how so if, medi if medical marijuana can take away any pain, you're asking? That's nasty. So with medical marijuana, there is no question. There's no... It is a, a godsend. Substance abuse? Yeah, well. A 
the greatest medicine is alcohol? Wine. Not for everything. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. It's a you know, book called Irresistible, written by Adam Alter, and he talks about all the different kind of addictions from in Trinhead video games, alcohol, drugs, pornography, everything. And with the drugs, the reason that people would again and again and again get addicted is um, they'll never have the same high as they did it the first time. And so they do it again and again, searching for that original high that's never going to come back again. Maybe. Or, that was great, let's have something greater. Yeah, but it doesn't, but Why? it's not greater. Why? It's not like it was the first time. Because the first time is always exciting? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how does one tell the difference between healing and recreation? And uh, the rabbi of the mind, another question. If it's the same, if it's a different person doing the same mitzvah, really a different, doing a different mitzvah day to day, like I'm a different person to putting on tefillin, then what difference does it make if I'm a different person on marijuana or something like that? Mm. I'm a different person anyway. Oh, you're different. When you're on marijuana, it's not you. Mm. It's the drug. Um, sorry, what's the book? How do you tell the difference between? <laughs> You're enjoying it too much? Then it's no good. Then it's recreational. No, you, you, can, t- you can tell. When a person says, uh, what, what is that, the animals you take on, pl- on planes, what are they called? No, 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 the emotional. Uh, yeah. Huh? Emotional service animal. You see, th- that is so scary. <laughs> Look what's happening to us. Every impulse, every little twinge becomes a medical crisis. This is university, and I think it's spreading to other universities. It's, you're not allowed to applaud because that sound makes some people nervous. What, what is happening to us? <laughs> so if somebody says, oh, there was applause, now I need marijuana, Med- <laughs> medically. <laughs> you can have some, but it's not for free to rabbi. So. <laughs> Yeah. And sort of, as you're saying, you know, we have to represent our people. We have to stick together. You know, sort of the people who promote the, well, it's, you know, it, I, I do it, it's great. Or, you know, like, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Or, you, you know, that sort of, yeah. if someone thinks it's working for them, that the attitude that, well, it should work for everybody or we should have it, this or that, the other thing. I can just imagine, it's, it's theoretical, hypothetical. I can imagine a person who is extremely committed devoted to serving God. Every minute he's always thinking, how do I... That could get a little heavy. I can imagine him saying, you know, I smoke a little, I do a little of... and, and, and I go back to work better. I could hear that argument. That's why I'm saying, for some people, if their direction in life is strong, their purpose is strong, their dedication is strong, maybe it wouldn't be so harmful. There's still the question of, are you fulfilling any mitzvah if you're in an altered state? No, I'm not going to be doing mitzvahs then. I'll just take it before I go to sleep. And Okay, I can't argue with that. 
But generally speaking, the average person is not that dedicated, not that clear, not that directed and purposeful. And for them, it would, it would be taking them in the wrong direction. I mean, you can tell immediately a guy starts to smoke or to use marijuana, and all of a sudden he loses his job. Bad luck? Coincidence? So we got we to gotta be honest, and we got to be on top of what's happening. But one thing is for sure, to learn to peel ourselves away from ourselves, definitely healthy. And you become more lovable too. People are so lonely today because the me is so inflexible. We can't, we can't relax enough to allow another into our space, into our world, into our lives, and we pay the price. We are alone. Marijuana will not cure that. Somebody made the argument that alcohol is a social uh, addiction, especially in the Jewish community. You don't hear of Jews coming home and taking a drink. They call up a couple of friends, get together, and then take a drink or more. But, but that, that idea of drinking by yourself, by chassidim, even if you're sitting at a party, you never pour yourself a drink. What are you, a drunk? If the host gives you a drink, you say, L'chaim. You never pour yourself a drink. So when you're alone, there's no drinking when you're alone. It's purely social. Drugs, on the other hand, are not necessarily a party uh, event. Of course, it could be. But if you're taking drugs at home, that is really not going to make, you, know, that you don't meet a lot of good friends that way. So the loneliness, the, the separateness, the, the isolation that we're suffering from, marijuana is not going to help. It'll, it'll, it'll make it worse. I use marijuana in the base of Mikdash. Uh, one of the ingredients in the anointing oil in Hebrew is called kinabasa, which sounds like cannabis. <laughs> well, if you want to use it as a, as a perfume, or uh, I, I don't know if that's cannabis. Probably not, because we would know about it if it was. Um, but there are there are ingredients in the uh, in the in the and the uh, in, in the spices that are kind of strange. Some of them are foul smelling, and yet when you mix them with the other eleven ingredients, so that, that was an interesting. Uh, and today we're not allowed to reproduce that. We're not allowed to make that same mixture. Must have been really powerful. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs. And there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us. Take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best. And join us for some enjoyable conversation.